I think we can start and share some real substantive framing. Um, Dr. Jones is our keynote guest and he'll be with us soon. He was, uh, he was the lawyer for Dr. Martin Luther King. He also was instrumental in drafting three of the most important speeches of our time. The I Have a Dream speech, the speech at Riverside Church in which, uh, in which Dr. King addressed the, uh, the impropriety of the, uh, of the nuclear, uh, of the uh, Vietnam War, uh, as well as his position on larger issues like the Cuban miss Missile Crisis, and most importantly, the letters from the Birmingham jail. Um, but while we're waiting for him, I want to quote from some of Dr. King's most important words to us. And that will just get us right in the right framework. I'm going to quote from Dr. King's Nobel lecture. And it's so timely. Recent events have vividly reminded us that nations are not reducing, but rather increasing their arsenals of weapons of mass destruction. The best brains in the highly developed nations of the world are devoted to military technology. The fact that most of the time human beings put the truth about the nature and risks of nuclear war out of their minds because it is too painful and therefore not acceptable does not alter the nature and risks of such a war. The device of rejection may temporarily cover up anxiety, but it does not bestow peace of mind and emotional security. In a day when vehicles hurtle through outer space and guided ballistic missiles carve highways of death through the stratosphere, no nation can claim victory in war. A so-called limited war will leave little more than a calamitous legacy of human suffering and a world war, God forbid. We must not wage war. It is necessary to love peace and sacrifice for it. We've inherited a big house, a great world house in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner, Westerner, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture and interest, who because we can never again live without each other, we must learn somehow in this one big world to live with each other. We must now give an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in our individual societies. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concerns beyond one's tribe, race, class, nation, is in reality a call for an all-embracing and unconditional love for all men. When I speak of love, I'm not speaking of some sentimental and weak response which is little more than emotional bosh. I am speaking of that force which all the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. I refuse to accept the cynical notion that nation after nation must spiral down a militaristic stairway into the hell of nuclear annihilation. And I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. And he ends, I believe that even amid today's mortar bursts and whining bullets, there's a hope for a brighter tomorrow. I believe that wounded justice lying prostrate on the blood flowing streets of our nations can be lifted from this dust of shame to reign supreme among the children of men. I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. I believe what self-centered men have torn down, men other-centered can build up. These words of Dr. King resonate today as we sit on the precipice of catastrophe as we are challenged exactly as we were then. And uh, I met, I met uh, 
Dr. Jones, who's we're trying to connect him. I met Dr. Jones at a summit of Nobel Peace Prize winners in Paris in 2008. And I was, I, I had the privilege of moderating a panel of uh, press, a, press, a press event. And Dr. Jones was sitting next to me and I didn't know who he was and uh, I, I didn't recognize him and I asked him and he explained that he was Martin Luther King's speechwriter. And I thought to myself, well, Mar I thought Martin Luther King's speechwriter was God. And then I thought to myself, well, God works through all of us. And the idea of a person being the only person that God is working through, how ignorant of me. And I thought to myself, all of us have God working through us if we would but open our hearts. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring on two of our guests while we're, while we're actually just trying to get technology with, with, uh, with Dr. Jones. And uh, I'm first going to introduce my dear friend, sister, uh, uh, met teacher, uh, Audrey, Audrey Kitagawa. Audrey is uh, the founder of the International Academy for Multi- cultural cooperation, the president of the Light of Awareness International Spiritual Family. She's the former advisor to the office of the special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations for Children and Armed Conflict. She's a lawyer by training and an inspired heart by choice. And uh, so I wanna give her the floor. Uh, she is a leader with whom I would, regarding whom I would say, uh, God works through her. Audrey, please. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. And at that uh, time that we are able to get uh, Clarence Jones on, then, you know, please, we, I will interrupt whatever I'm saying so we can hear from him because there's a whole slew of questions that I would like to ask him. So I too am waiting with bated breath to hear what he has to say. And I, I really want to express my deepest appreciation to Marilyn Turkovic at the Charter for Compassion and to you, Jonathan, for this special invitation to be on this panel today. And I also want to express my appreciation to Clarence Jones, who has given history and all of us some of the most inspiring and moving speeches given by Dr. King that lives beyond his physical life into immortality on the records of time. And I would like to focus on and lift up Dr. King's Nobel Peace Lecture, which you may quoted from earlier, and which he gave on the evening of December 11th, 1964 at the University of Oslo. He pointed out in that speech that in spite of the advances in science and technology, there was a poverty of the spirit and that we have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers, having allowed the internal spiritual to become lost in the external. To give some historic context to the events going on in the world in which Dr. King's speech was given in 1964, that was the year following the historic March on Washington in August 1963. And I see that uh, Clarence Jones has joined us right now. So I'm going to cede uh, whatever I have to say to after he has given his presentation, since I am so eager to hear what he has to say. Thank you so much, uh, Clarence. Jones for joining us now. Hi, how are you, ma'am? Fine, thank you. So, Jonathan? So Marilyn is the host, and Marilyn has been dealing with the issue that modern man has become a technical giant and a moral midget. But today we're going to hear from a moral giant. And uh, Marilyn, I consider you a moral giant with the work that you've done with the Charter of Compassion, getting hundreds of cities to focus on this quality millions of people, and, uh, and you've been working on the technology. So Marilyn, please, uh, you are our host and the organizer of this, please. You're muted. Of, of course I'm muted because you would, have, you would have had to have heard everything that was going on in the background. And, um, but thank you, uh, Dr. Jones, who is the most patient person in the world. No um, and um, 
you know, I'm so excited and so honored um, that, you know, we're here today because um, I think my whole journey in life started um, with an organization called Southern Christian Leadership. I left college, went to Chicago and volunteered. And after a few weeks found myself in Mississippi um, on the Meredith March. And every night I listened to um, speeches that were debates, uh, opportunities for wisdom that happened between Martin Luther King, uh, Stokely Carmichael, um, Reverend Jesse Jackson. Uh, it was the most incredible time, but it was a time of extreme tension um, and a, a time for insight into situations that um, a young person, a college person, uh, probably had never really thought of. Um, and I think that there's a wisdom behind um, and, and a theology and a philosophy between all of the things that we associate with Martin Luther King, but it's so much more. And I think that Clarence Jones is going to, uh, to show us that today. Um, and I, I'm not sure what happened before I came on. And so I, um, I just wanna say that there is a legacy uh, here on, on the screen today. And the legacy is Dr. Jones and, it, and it's Jonathan. I had wonderful things to say about Jonathan, but I think that they might spill over uh, as uh, we continue on this journey together. I'm excited about having Audrey here and uh, Bill Swing. Uh, the three of us, Jonathan, Audrey, uh, and Bishop Swing, are all part of something that you might have heard about, Voices for a Nuclear Free World, and it's something that binds us together. And so I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Jonathan, who might have already introduced uh, Dr. Jones, but we'll take it uh, from what you know you've done. <laughs> Well, I did partially introduce Dr. Jones. Let me introduce myself first, because uh, uh, a lot of people don't know me. I have been working uh, in a way like Dr. Jones, uh, trying to work from behind and to get things done. So I'm the president of the Global Security Institute that was founded by Senator Alan Cranston and Mikhail Gorbachev. I'm the representative to the United Nations of the World Summit of Nobel Peace Prize winners. And, uh, and I'm the senior advisor to the Committee on National Security of the International Law Section of the American Bar Association. But more importantly, I'm trying my best to discipline my heart in the, di in the discipline of nonviolence and thought, intention, and deed. And so the words of Dr. King uh, are the words that help that guidance. And so it's a great honor to, for me to, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Jones. I did say a few things about some of the key things that he did, but you know, in terms of the speeches that he worked on, but he was also the person who, uh, who made the legal arguments. He was also the person who went and, 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 and went and raised the bail money. He was also the person who was there on the barricades and, uh, and he, he, gave up, he gave up a law practice to go on the walk for justice, for peace. Uh, and he has continued that walk. He's a man in his 90s and he's still an activist and he's still a lawyer for justice and peace. So it, it's just an incredible honor to have a man whose engagement uh, in, in the good things of our time. And in some, when, uh, when a letter was written to the New York State Bar Association so he could practice, the letter, was, uh, the letter of recommendation was written by none other than, than uh, Reverend Martin Luther King, identifying Dr. Jones as a man of the highest integrity. That's, that's about the best recommendation you could get. Uh, Dr. Jones? Yes, sir. The floor is yours, sir. And we oh. are so glad that, that you're with us. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm. Uh... Uh, yes, I am currently 91 years old. 
I uh, I met Martin Luther King Jr. rather unexpectedly. I won't go through the details of the meeting. I'll just go to the beginning of the journey. In the uh, second week of February, 1960, um, in, uh, in, in Los Angeles, California. And for the next seven and a half years, I uh, worked initially as a political advisor, then his personal lawyer, and then 24-7 Jeff's speechwriter until April 4th, 1967. Um, if I am forced to bookmark Martin King's life and legacy. For someone who works so closely with him, remembering that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was founded in 1979 by a group of Southern Black clergymen, the purpose of forming the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was to, in their words, to redeem the soul of America. That was before I met Dr. King. Um, as I said, if I had to bookend, there's so many speeches, many of many of whom you of you know, and many some of which you don't know, unless you were locally involved in various uh, movements around the country, not just in the South, but in the Midwest and in California. Uh, as I said, the bookend of his life would be on one part of the bookend, one part of the bookend would be his uh, letter from the Birmingham jail. And the other bookend would be the April 4th, 1968 speech he gave publicly opposing the war in Vietnam. But let me go back to the first part of the bookend, following up on the formation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to redeem the soul of America. Nothing has been written before or after, in my judgment, in the Civil Rights Movement more eloquent than his letter from a Birmingham jail. Because that letter written after he was arrested uh, in Birmingham on Easter, on Good Friday, April 12th, 1963, that letter, uh, uh, is, is, is forever, it's endurable. That letter uh, resulted from his response to a full page ad that had been placed by a group of white clergymen in the local Birmingham newspaper, the Birmingham Herald. And that full page ad signed by prominent uh, clergymen, there may have been one rabbi who signed it also but they were the most prominent religious persons in the city of Birmingham. They took out a full page ad in the uh, largest circulation newspaper in Birmingham, Alabama. And in the full page ad, they, they, they criticized Dr. King first for being in Birmingham and leading uh, uh, street demonstrations and uh, and characterized him as an outside agitator. Now, as I was the only person, lawyer or otherwise, uh, permitted to go in and see him, when I went in to see him uh, on the uh, the Good Friday in the afternoon after he'd been arrested. Uh, I, 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 when I came into the jail, 
I had to walk literally a, a gamut of parents who were shouting at me when they, they knew and uh, knew who I was, shouting at me and say, Lawyer Jones, Attorney Jones, you're Dr. King's New York lawyer. You tell him we gotta, you gotta bail our kids out. Our kids are in jail. You gotta get, you gotta bail our kids out. So when I go into see Martin, I hear the 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 the, um, the, um, the voices of the parents yelling in my ear, and I tell him that. But he he had great respect for me and indeed affection for me. But he virtually dismissed me when I get and I told him about the problem I was having with this gauntlet of parents shouting at me. He says, "Well, you and Harry Belafonte have to solve that problem." Have you seen this? So I said, I don't know what you're talking about. At which point he showed me a copy of a newspaper ad that had got him so agitated, signed by these clergymen. And he had already started to write an answer to the, full, to the statements made in the full page ad on blank pieces of old dirty newspaper he could find on paper towels, anything that was a white space. And he put them in little piles, pile one, pile two, pile three, pile four and five. And he asked me to take these piles out and I put them under my shirt and tie and, and give them to the secretary who worked for him with Wyatt Walker. Now I just, I just did what I was told, I never looked, I just, I said, Wyatt, whatever the woman's name, Dr. King is so agitated. And then when I went back in to see him, that would have been the following morning, that Friday, I took a blank white sheets of paper under my shirt and tie. When I went to visit him, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't pat me down. Everybody knew I, I bore that heavy moniker of that was Dr. King's New York lawyer. First of all, I was dressed different than most people. Most of the lawyers there, I wore a tie and a shirt white shirt, Rolex watches, you know, pin, gray pinstripe suits, tailored suits. So I looked, I looked differently and spoke differently. And, uh, and the guards recognized me, everybody. I mean, I, they, they knew I was Dr. King's New York lawyer. And, um, and this process went on for a period of the Friday afternoon. As I'm leaving Friday afternoon, uh, and by the way, when I'm taking the materials that he has written on now full sheets of paper out, I bring in paper and I put it back under my shirt and tie and I take it out. I never once look, read, I don't care about it. I go back to my uh, hotel room at the, uh, at the uh, uh, the A.G. Gaston Motel, and uh, several urgent calls for me from Harry Belafonte in New York. I return Harry's call, and he says, how soon can you get to New York? I said, well, how soon do I have to be in New York? He says, as soon as possible. So I, I think I got the last flight out of Birmingham uh, to LaGuardia Airport, and Harry had given me some instructions. He says, now you're probably going to land in New York after midnight, after 12 midnight. But when you get, if it's one o'clock in the morning, on two, two o'clock in the morning, you call this number. He's expecting your call. So it was, you know, it'd be 12, 30, sometime between 12 and 1 a.m. in the morning, New York time at LaGuardia. I called a call and I called the home of a man by the name of Hugh Morrow, who lived on Sutton Place. He was Nelson Rockefeller's, one of his principal advisors. He says, Dr. Jones, the, uh, the governor and his brother, David, President of Chase Bank, would like to see whether they can be helpful to you. Uh, please meet me and uh, David and the governor at the uh, Chase Bank at 46th Street and the Avenue of the Americas. Now, this is on a Saturday in April 1963. First of all, that was that's, that's where the then headquarters of the Chase Bank were. There were no banks open on Saturday. Uh, there were no ATMs. So I go into this bank 
at Avenue of the Americas. And there's Governor Rockefeller and David Rockefeller waiting me. I go into the bank. Now, I, 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 you know, I mean, I had been into a bank. I've been into banks before. I never really paid attention, except that you go into a bank. I'm aware that this is part of a bank where there's a big, big vault door. You know, I've been in different banks. I mean, I, I just never paid attention other than the fact that I knew in most banks there's this big place with this. But in the Chase Bank, you know, I mean, I'd watch gangster movies. So, you know, I'd watch gangster movies. So, I, I mean, I, I've seen gangster movies where there's, they're robbing the bank and they turn this big thing and open up. Well, that's what, I, that's what they did. David uh, Rockefeller went in. Turn this thing in this, this Moses safe. The door, the, the thick of the, the door of the bank was about a foot thick, at least. Wheel and turn and pull the bank. David uh, walks into the bank. His brother Nelson is standing outside, and I'm standing nearby, and so I can see David go inside the bank, and I can see as he goes inside from floor to ceiling. The canvas and plastic bags. Uh, the plastic bags I saw were money. And the canvas bags I just assume also had money. David just grabs a plastic bag, grabs it down, pulls it down on the floor. He says, This is $100,000 in cash. He said, You know, uh, federal regulations require that we have some explanation, signatory, who receives this money. So I said, fine. You see, you see that man sitting over there? Go over and see him. So I go with him. Man is sitting behind the desk. He was executive VP at uh, Chase Bank. As I'm walking over, so he's typing. And he says, well, what's your name? And I says, Clarence Jones. You have a middle name? I says, yeah. Clarence B. Jones. And what's the B for? Benjamin. Clarence Benjamin Jones. He's typing. And I said, what are you typing? He said, well, you know, bank regulations that's required that we have some evidence of who we gave this money to. Now, what he was signing, what he was typing was a promissory note. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a civil rights lawyer, but I also, you know, I mean, my specialty was copyright law and negotiable instruments. So I, 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 knew, well, I knew something, I wasn't a dummy about law. And I knew that in the general law, in the general law of negotiable instruments, uh, uh, um, generically, there are two types of promissory notes. A promissory note that's payable uh, by a designated date, uh, one year after date, 30 days after date, three years after date. And then the other promissory notes are called payable on demand, a demand promissory notes. Now demand promissory notes, different states have requirements about uh, 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 the creditor. The creditor on a demand promissory note has got to give the, uh, the, the debtor some time. You just can't call up and say, I need the money in an hour. They, 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 they require some minimum statutory period. Normally it's about, I don't, think, I don't think I've seen anyone shorter than three days. Normally it's five days. The average is three to five business days, not more than five business days for one. So I signed it, you know? And they, uh, and they, and they, and they, and they give me a hundred, give me a hundred thousand dollars cash and a little chain to put around my uh, uh, wrist. Now I am pissed, I'm angry because I'm angry at Harry Belafonte. I mean, he didn't tell me, he told me that Chase Bank was gonna uh, help us. But he didn't tell me that I personally was going to have to sign a, a, a five-day de statutory demand note on the laws of the state of New York. So I go to the payphone and I call him. So I call Harry and I said, "Everything, how's everything work out? You got the money?" I said, "Yeah, I got the money, but you didn't. You didn't tell me I had to sign a demand promissory note." He says, "What's that?" I said, "Harry, I had to sign a demand promissory note, not a long-term promissory note." I said, "The one I signed, I think, is, I think it's demand. It can be." Callable in five days. I don't know. I was just so anxious to get out of there. At which point, Harry says over the phone, "Well, better you than me." I said, "But you got more money than me. I don't have no money. I don't have no hundred thousand dollars." Anyway, I go get on the plane, and it's interesting. In April 1963, 
I'm carrying this briefcase. There's a hundred thousand dollars in cash. Nobody, I don't go through no security. Nobody is looking to my briefcase. Nobody is. I just get on the plane with a hundred thousand dollar chain to my wrist, and I get down to Birmingham, and then I negotiate with a bail bondsman. Now the bail bondsman, local African American bail bondsman, I don't think he believed that Dr. King could get the bail money. So when he saw me, Dr. King's so-called New York lawyer, returning in his gray pinpoint student shirt, and Rolex watch, instead of, I, I thought we had a deal that all I had to do, all I had, we had to do was apply. A bail bond that I works, you put up a certain amount of cash. So if the um, bail bond is $1,000, uh, you know, uh, you put up 5% in cash. Most of the bail bonds were $1,000 or $2,000. But this local black bail bondsman, seeing that I got the money, he wanted he wanted to say, "Oh well, I think you should put up a seven and a half percent, or ten and a half, or ten percent cash." I said, "No, no, 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 no. I mean, no, no. We need to we need for this bail money to go." Anyway, I go through that process. I'm I'm angry at Harry. I'm pissed at the bail bondsman. I'm tired. Uh, uh, my love for Martin's being tested. I'm angry at him because uh, I feel he's uh, taking advantage of my devotion to him. But then I sit back and say, well, listen, I'm his, I'm his lawyer. What, I, what I mean, who else is he going to turn to? So I got through all of that. And then um, I go back to New York. Now, on a, on a, I don't know, it may have been Tuesday morning or whenever it was. One day early the next week, I'm in my office. And my, the receptionist comes up to me and says, Mr. Jones, there's a messenger here from the Chase Manhattan Bank. I said, yes. He says, uh, they, they don't want to talk to us. They have to see you. So I go out and there's a message from the bank. And he identifies himself. And he asked me for some in, uh, credentials to identify that I was, in fact, Clarence B. Jones. But my driver's license or whatever, I showed him to convince him that I was indeed the person that this letter Mark personal confidential was uh, uh, indicated for us. So he, he gave me the letter, I opened it. And inside was the promissory note that I had signed. And I turned over and it said, paid in full with a stamp. And oh. I, 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 I said to myself, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Now I knew I didn't pay it. And I said, now, first thing I said, I said, <laughs> the Rockefeller's got some juice, brother. <laughs> I said, paid in full. I didn't pay it. So that was uh, from a sideboard. I don't want to get, that's not the subject of our conversation, but that was the beginning of a, 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 a checkered and conflicted journey with Nelson Rockefeller, who, who, um, who who had who, who regrettably sold his soul at Attica. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But the point is that's how we got the bail money. Now let me just tell you something. I want to focus on Dr. King. You know, you 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 know of him, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And, and, and a lot of people outside of this, many people in the civil rights movement, but particularly who did not work with him in the South, but generally, uh, you know, they have this uh, justifiably uh, 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 opinion of this extraordinary man, how gifted he was and so forth. And they think of him as this gifted civil rights leader. But many of those people, both in the African-American community and, and, and white community, they sometimes too readily pass over or don't reflect that Dr. King was a minister of the gospel, a deeply religious minister of the gospel before he was a civil rights leader. He had an encyclopedic knowledge 
from the King James Version of the Bible, and different than most Black clergymen, had a deep knowledge of the Talmud. I mean, how many, how many Black religious scholars know anything about Jewish history? It's one thing to know about your own religious history. But how many Black Jewish scholars at that time? You understand what I'm saying? 1960 to 1960. How many Black? I mean, he was yes an area. I mean, first of all, his his uh, he, he he went to the Boston School of Divinity. Dr. King was a brilliant. He went to he went to it was brilliant. He was a child prodigy in terms of his academic. But he used to resent the constant references to him being Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights leader. Among those who were close to him, he said, don't they know that I was a minister of the gospel long before I was ever a civil rights leader? And he bristled. Now, this is important because as a civil rights leader, uh, he had no fear. No, as a civil rights leader, he had fear. I take that back. But as a minister of the gospel, he had no fear. I mean, it was like it was like he was two different persons. I came to put the pieces of Dr. King's life together by different experiences I had. We were in Albany, Georgia, in nineteen sixty one or sixty two. I can't remember. Maybe in 1962. We're in Albany, Georgia. And we were sharing a room together. It's late, but I've been working with Dr. Anderson in the Albany movement. And I'm, uh, we're in this room with twin beds, and I have my back to him. And, I, and Dr. King is sitting on the bed as I'm undressing. And he said, you know, Clarence, you and Stanley Levison. Stanley Levison was a, a Jewish lawyer. Dr. King's accountant. He was this. He met Dr. King before me. He met Dr. King with Baird Russell. Uh, uh, it is a. It is a. Uh, it is a travesty that uh, Stanley Levison, who is, uh, who is uh, uh, like a, a giant, in the pantheon of the civil rights movement of Martin King, has been diminished to so people, so few people knew about him, but I knew about him. And I knew how close. He was Dr. King's accountant. He handled all of Dr. King's uh, dealing with books and did his tax returns. So he said to me, he says, you know, I'm sitting on the bed. He says, you and Stanley are like wintertime soldiers. So I said, what do you mean, Martin? And he leans over to me. He says, you know, anybody can walk with you in the warm sunlight of an August summer, but only a wintertime soldier walks with you at midnight in the alpine chill of winter. Clarence, you are my wintertime soldier. So I said, oh, come on, Martin. I said, I wouldn't go that far. But I, I began to sink into me. I began to tear up. And I said, that's that, that really fits Danny Levinson, but that doesn't fit. He says, no, 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 brother. He says, we've been together a short time. And I know, I, I know I can't, I can't ever persuade you not to wear your Rolex watch and your gray pinstripe suits and custom tailored shirts <laughs> when we go in to meet with the clergyman. I'm not going to be able to change him. That's who you are. And I just tell people, look, that's my New York clock. I'm not going to try to change him. He's devoted to me. If that's, I mean, that's his life. Now, one of the reasons he didn't change me is because I worked from, uh, from 1960 to April 4th, 1968. You know how you know what legal fees I got paid during that seven and a half period? What do you think? Zero. I made more money during those periods than the entire staff and people of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. What am I gonna look like taking money? That's the best 
Okay. Now I, I you know, I mean, you know, I was, I, I don't, I was raised by Irish nuns. My pa my parents were domestic household servants. Father was a maid. My mother was a maid and a cook. My father was a chef in the garden. They didn't have any education. I was put on a Catholic boarding school raised by Irish nuns from the age of six to 14. You know what those Irish nuns used to tell me and the other colored boys they had? What do you think they said to us? Master Jones, every day. First of all, we had classes of about 20 students, two nuns teaching us, but you know what they said? You know, it was from the dormitory. I was in this Catholic boarding school 10 and a half months a year with them. You know what they said to us? And they also had uh, uh, Native Americans they brought in from the reservations in uh, uh, Nevada, New Mexico. Now, my mother was a real, deeply religious person. I don't even know. I, I, I found out earlier that she went to the same school she sent me. So she was a Catholic. I didn't know anything about that. I just knew this is where my mama sent me. Now I, and so for 10 and a half, for 10 and a half months a year, you asked me to come and speak to you, right? So I'm, I'm going to tell you. For 10 and a half months a year, I'm looking up at this white skin, many of them hidden glasses, and this habit. And they said to us, if not every day, every other day, Master Jones, be a good boy. We love you. Jesus loves you. And you are beautiful. Hear me now. Master Jones, be a good boy. We love you, Jesus loves you, and you are beautiful. Now, come on now. Now, from the age of six years old until you got to be 14 years old, you're having some white woman, many of them have glasses, saying that to you and often putting their arms around you to affirm what they meant or to offset when they had the ruler and you went up to diagram a sentence and they hit your hand with the ruler. So they were offsetting that love that they, that tough love they gave you in the classroom with that personal love. So you can imagine when the age of 14, I went to public school. First of all, I was excluded. I didn't have to take any Latin in public school. Because I had more Latin, I, I, I had more Latin than anybody could have. Okay, but that's my early. So I shared that with Martin, and he said, he said, uh, he said, well, how, how you end up working with me, a Baptist preacher? And so I said, well, the Lord works in mysterious ways. He has wonders to perform. I don't know. You. I'm blessed. Why should I still be living at 91 years old? Why should I still be living? Hmm? Medical issues, cancer. Last week, had vascular vein surgery in my left eye. I just took the bandage off yesterday because I lost. I was blind in my left eye for two and a half, three minutes last week. So I had to go in and had to go into my the, the vein, the vascular vein above my left eye, take out tissue samples. Of what would account for this for the uh, illness, sadness? But from the age of uh, 35 until 45, 50 almost, I never smoked. I jogged six miles a day, six days a week. My medical people tell me today, they tell me 15 years of jogging six days a week, hmm? six miles a day. 
And I didn't, I didn't like, I didn't really like meat. I love fish and chicken. Now that was offset by the fact that I drank martinis every day. Okay. But I drank martinis every day and drank champagne, but I ran six and a half miles a day. Rain, snow. I mean, I did, I'm in Lake, I'm, I'm speaking at the US Embassy in Geneva, Switzerland. So I'm jogging around Lake Geneva. I'm there for five days. I'm jogging around Lake Geneva in a, in a, in a, a wine suit. So when I go into town, into, in, into Geneva, Switzerland, I'm not wearing my jogging suit, I'm just wearing a ring. But they figure, <laughs> they didn't, I didn't see any other African-Americans walking around in, in the Geneva, Switzerland. But they figured this guy walking around in great Smith white suit, white shirt and so forth, that that was the same guy who was jogging. So I got more free meals. <laughs> I tell people, oh, I love Geneva because all, all the restaurants, <laughs> the restaurant owners would invite. And then when I found out, and then when I, they found out that I was a lawyer for Martin King, oh man, you would have thought I walked on water. Give me the world. Now, why do I tell you these things? It ain't about me. No, 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 no. I'm just an accident in history. You know, someone asked me, if, if you had not met Dr. King, what do you think your life would have been? And I said immediately, I would have ended up as an amoral, empty-headed, very rich Negro. That would probably would have happened to me, OK? But let me tell you something. You are accidentally blessed. You are accidentally blessed because you're looking at me. I'm 91 years old. Okay? I, I, I'm, I'm not telling you what somebody told me. I was just, before we were trying to get on, I was in the, I'm in the process of writing a, a tribute to Andy Young, you know, and I'm thinking about how Dr. King insisted that I had to go meet him with him to hire Andy Young in 19, whenever it was, 1962, 1964, and we had, because Dwight Walker left. And I'm thinking of all the, I'm thinking of all the periods of time, of all the, of all the journeys I've had with Martin Luther King Jr. Now, that, I wanna say one other, I wanna say one thing that we learned very early. I learned, I said, you know, uh, we learned that there's no way that 12% of the population, no matter how eloquent their spokesman was, Martin Luther King Jr., was gonna change the hearts of some 80% of the population. What's gonna happen? 12% of the population, African-Americans, white people, what's gonna happen? It's only when a majority of those uh, white people came to understand that it was in their self-interest to understand, to work with us, to end segregation. Now, as smart as I was, enraged by Irish nuns, I began to think and look very carefully. And, I, and Martin and I would share this. I said, you know, Martin, I said, there are white people and there are white people. I said, now, I was raised by Irish Catholic nuns. But I can tell you, all those white people we see, they may look white, but they're not all the same. And the thing that we both noticed early on is that there were white people who looked like such They looked uh, from a distance <laughs> until you got up close and talked to them. They looked like any other white people except they were Jewish. That was one of the most profound discoveries in my life. I'm, 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 a, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a bashful person. So I go up and I see some white woman or family work. I said, hey, Miss So-and-so, I said, I said, I'm Dr. King's lawyer. Why, why, why are you here? Why, why are you here with us? And she would say, you know, Attorney Jones, I'm here because of my grandmother. I said, well, really? She says, did you know anything about the Holocaust? I said, you, I sure do. 
He says, I'm here because that's what my grandmother would want me to do. Do you hear me? I'm crying because that I, I said that I, I had that. I didn't have that experience one time. Listen to me. I didn't have it like, like it was like a one-off. Hmm. A Jewish men, Jewish men who were not rabbis, Jewish men who would just, who would cry to me as to why they loved and fall in love with Martin King. Because they believe they were doing what their grandparents would want them to do because of the experience of the Holocaust. Now, I'm a tough son of a bitch, but I can tell you something. You talk to one or more of those people as I did, and if you don't cry like I'm crying now, then I don't know what's wrong with you. That's the way of saying that we came to understand that the power of the civil rights movement, we, did, we, 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 we didn't sit down and study it. We didn't sit down and read about it. Of course, he loved Stanley Levison. He had good experience, but we didn't. St we 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 saw it. We saw it when he was in Saint Augustine, Florida, and he gave and he gave a, a call out for assistance, and a plane load of Jewish rabbis came down to Augustine. So I couldn't believe it. I said, "But don't rabbis have anything else to do?" So these these as this ninety one year old. Negro, when you marry that with his own Brit upbringing by Catholic nuns, hmm? when you marry that experience of being raised by Irish Catholic nuns and working with Jewish people, then you've got to, to, the person you're talking to, you don't have to tell me, I know I'm the baddest piece of work on the earth. I didn't create myself. It came from that extraordinary devotion to Martin Luther King Jr. And one of the reasons about being 91 and being having a good memory and good eye is that I don't forget. I can see those Jewish men and women just like I can see you today. So I think people say, why do you live so long? I say, I think one of the reasons I live so long because the good Lord wants me to stay here to tell this story because <laughs> I'm one of the real ones. This, is, this, ain't, this ain't stuff, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and that's why I am singularly honored. You don't take the time out to talk to me. I'm, I'm not stupid. You take the time to talk to me in my representative capacity, in my legacy capacity. I understand that I'm not offended, I'm honored. You can't talk to Martin King, but you can talk to me. And that's the greatest honor that you can give me. Okay. I, 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 uh, Early in my life, I would say that I don't think I'm worthy. But on the contrary, I am worthy. I think I, I think I am exactly the person you can be talked to. Now, one of the saddest things, just let me just put one of the saddest things we got to deal with is is, and I've been talking about it, is the ascendancy of the Black Lives Matter movement in dealing with this police brutality. But what I've seen, what has happened, I've seen some segments of the Black Lives Matter movement go off in a direction that, that, that is so offensive. They are, are turning to Jewish people and saying, well, Israel got a problem with the Palestinians, Israel hates all. Uh, blacks anyway, and we don't want you. So I'm saying, where is this craziness coming from? 
And so I have talked about it with black clergy. And I've said to them, you dare not be silent. You cannot talk to me and sing the praises of Martin Luther King Jr. You dare not be silent. And you see these rise in episodes of anti-Semitism against our Jewish brothers and sisters. I don't have the answer to the Palestinian question. And neither does Israel. They're, they're struggling with it. And neither do the Palestinians. They're struggling with it. But I'm not going to have some. And what is crazy? You know what's crazy? Out here, I couldn't believe it. I see young, I see, I see young Jewish students buying into this crap. And I'm saying to myself, where does that come from? And so one of the things that is one of the things which I don't have, I will, I don't have to deal with. I wish I didn't have to deal with, but I have to deal with it. Because if I don't, if I don't go after them with hammer and tongs, if I don't try to, to knock some sense into their head, they will destroy everything that Martin King and the Jewish community work for together. They'll destroy it. I don't want there ever to be a question among the member of the Jewish community that when there's an incident of anti-Semitism, that there's one ounce of hesitancy. That a black civil rights leader wouldn't be there. And they better not tell me that the reason they're hesitant is because of some nonsense about uh, the Palestinian question in Israel. Well, let, the, let Israel and the Palestinians solve the goddamn question. But don't tell me their failure to solve it is going to prevent you from doing what is morally right and your responsibility. So I, 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 they, they know they do not want to bring no Black Lives Matter movement leader to me because I will chop them up and take them out. I have an obligation to do that because that's what Martin King would want me to do. I should add nonviolently <laughs> with love. Yeah, I love them. I love, I love, listen, I love my misplaced black brothers and sisters. What I don't understand is what's going on in some of these universities where a, a young Jewish student, how can a young Jewish student get caught up in this nonsense? I mean, how can I be, how, how can I be more? I mean, I don't understand it. I'm, 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 I'm more defensive, defending their heritage than they are. They get caught up in this nonsense. And they, well, I'm probably preaching to the choir, no, you but I mean, I'm talking too much. I, uh, I just want you to say you honor me. You didn't know <laughs> that after all this difficulties of getting on that you're gonna have to listen to this, right? You didn't know that. <laughs> Well, you came into my house. I welcome you into my house. But having come into my house, you had to listen to what I have to say. Okay? I love you. There is no amount of money. There are no amount of entitlements. There's nothing you can ever do or say to me that will ever equal the seven and a half years I spent with Martin Luther King Jr. I don't know how this educated, Catholic educated Wall Street lawyer, copyright specialist, ended up with this Southern Baptist preacher. I don't know. All I'm saying, thanks to my 15 years of jogging and daily martinis and champagne, I'm here to tell you, I love you because I
I'll take any questions. Dr. Jones, when, uh, when I met you in Paris at the summit of the Nobel Peace Prize winners. Get out of here, that's right. Jonathan Wright. And, uh, and I didn't recognize you because I didn't know about the hidden hand, the hand in the hand. <laughs> it, goes back, it goes back to Mahavir, who came up with the idea of ahimsa and nonviolence. Yes, 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 the yes. Hindu, the Hindu dimension. Yes. Of, 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 of Reverend, Reverend King yes. and Gandhi. You got Jewish, Go you got Christian, you got Hindu, you got yes. the whole thing. And then you said that you were Martin Luther King's speechwriter. And I thought to myself, God was Martin Luther King's speechwriter. Come on now. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's and then right. I said, now I know that yeah. I was right. Yeah, God was right. You're right. God was God, but God had God's got more than two hands. That's God's right. God's got more than four hands. That's right, brother Jonathan. That's right. God's got a lot of hands. He does and a lot of hearts. And my dad was one of those Jewish activist supporters, and he produced the Lena Horn song. Now, <laughs> yeah, my dad produced that the first civil rights song <laughs> that was to Havana Gila. Oh yeah, I'm listening yeah. to you, Granoff. What's wrong with me? I'm stupid as a dumb dumb. I'm dumb. I got it. I got it. <laughs> now, I, I want to hand over the I want to hand over the platform to uh, to a, a man of the cloth, who, like Reverend King, has devoted his has really devoted his life to building those bridges that 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 our great leader called us to do. Uh, the Right Reverend William Swing, Bill, 26 years, the bishop, Episcopalian Bishop of, of California. He was the guy who, who really, really invigorated the light at Grace Cathedral up on Knob Hill for the whole thing, working on, on homelessness and every social justice issue. And then when he retired from that, he helped as a visionary created the United Religions Initiative, which is the world's largest uh, interfaith organization bringing people together of different faiths. And I work with him in a group called Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons. And when I found out that he brought George Shultz to the group. Come on and, now. Yeah, and William Perry, former Secretary of Defense. Get on out of here. Yeah, so he's got like, <laughs> he's with homeless people and he's with, you know, he's with secretaries of state. And I what I found working with him was he treats everybody the way you just treated us, Clarence, the way you just treated us, which was, wow, um, Umbutu, I am, I am, I am me because of you. I, you oh, just brother. touched my heart. I'm, I'm tearing up. And I want to let uh, Reverend Swing share a little bit with you. Wow. But, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Jones, I'm, uh, I'm just stunned. Uh, I'm honored. I look at you. When I look at you, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when no, I look, no, 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 no. I, I so think the people memories in... come flooding back. Oh, and good. I, I remember the role of our religious leaders. I'll keep quiet, sir. No, no, no. I'd love to hear that, but I think the people in Geneva were right that you do walk on water. <laughs> 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 in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wine colored jogging suit. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, secondly, um, you would have made a great preacher. <laughs> you just, you, you spent, you mis me. you've misused your life. Well, you you know, should have I, been in a pulpit someplace. You know what? My, my sons and my friends in the civil rights movement, they tell me that. And I said, well, you know, you know, this process of osmosis, I spent, when I wasn't around business people, I spent so much time around preachers, you know? I mean, yes, I don't mean like a few days. I mean, like years and years in their presence, listening to them, being at their home, listening to them preach. You know, I mean, I, I guess I could have. I don't know. It. <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, came out to me today was uh, uh, your uh, deep commitment to uh, the Jewish people. Uh, I just 
I, I wasn't expecting that. I, I just, that, that caught me completely off guard. And uh, I'm so glad to hear that. Well, you know, I think that uh, I, I think the years every day between six and 14 raised by Irish Catholic nuns so deeply embedded in me a sense of religious compassion. Now, I was too young to know anything except I felt immensely indebted to the Catholic Church for the early start they gave me in my life. And I told Martin this. And, 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 and meeting him was like, he helped me marry my early religious training <laughs> with his deep devotion to his Christian faith as learned as a Baptist minister. His PhD was in theology. So I learned a lot from this theologian, Dr. King, okay? Supplemented by extraordinary life experience that Jonathan Grenoff has reminded me about. Well, one of the things that uh jumps out of me is that uh, how well loved you were as a boy. Oh. That love, oh. love begets love. Oh, oh. And oh. if you don't get it, it's hard to give it away. Can I tell you something? When I talk to young African-American men who were troubled, and I think to myself, God, how my mother particularly must have loved me to take her only son and put him 10 and a half months a year, 16, from the age of six to 14, someplace other than where she was. That is some powerful love. Okay? Yeah. And, and, the, and the nuns who loved you. That, but that's just one I point. Yeah. He put me in a place where I received love and other boys that would, I would have never got. I mean, I mean, there's no way in the world that a young Negro black boy is going to have a, a white nun put his arms around him, looking down through her glasses and telling you that, Master Jones, be a good boy. We love you. Jesus loves you, and you are beautiful. Now you can't tell. Now you tell me. I don't know. They don't have a drug. They don't have a cocaine. They don't have no forms of cocaine or no form of drugs or drug. They can't make a drug. They can't make a synthetic drug to put in your veins to shoot to shoot up with. That's more powerful than that. It doesn't exist. Understand? I got you. I got you. You're right. And you, and you, and you yourself. I mean, give me a break, Father. I mean, look at you. I mean, I mean, I, I can put two and two together. <laughs> you know, I can put two and two together. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I mean, you and Jonathan Granoff and Audrey Kittawag, Kittawag, you have other people. You could be doing other things. Yes, you respect me. You, 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 you show affection for me to have me, but I'm not stupid. There are other important things that are going on in the world. I am so honored that you let me into your, 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 your internet Zoom house. Okay. Oh. One of the things that you're doing for us today is uh, reducing the distance between Martin Luther King Jr. and ourselves. Uh, oh, if I can do that, we were not. We weren't on the march. We weren't there in on the balcony. We weren't there. Were you there right. when they? Uh, we weren't there. But 
You're saying, you were you there when they crucified him? Is to reduce that's the that's distance. That's so that's we're, that's we're right with him. There's a great Negro spiritual. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Jonathan Granoff? Yes, my brother. I don't want to take too much time, so I'll be as brief as possible. You know that uh, Lech Walensky from Poland was there. Yes. Okay. He could speak no English. So when he found out who I was and uh, so forth, he came over with his interpreter. He puts his hand on my hand and he's talking through his interpreter. And he tells me the story that uh, the people, the Gdansk ship hard workers in Poland, they could, uh, they could, they they could, they could speak no English, but they learned things phonetically, and they learned to sing, uh, "We shall overcome" phonetically. And he says there came a time, uh, uh, Mr. This is all, this is all being spoken to me. He's holding my hand and he's starting to tear. He's tearing. He's crying, crying. Is he telling me a story? Is there came a time when five thousand Gdansk Shipyard workers stood up and sang phonetically, we <laughs> shall overcome. <laughs> the next day, the communist government of Poland fell. And he says, with tears in his eyes, I became the president of Poland because of your Dr. King. Now, I want to tell you something. I'm a creative person, but I can't make that stuff up. You know, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah, Cl Clarence, you know, God doesn't have a mouth. God doesn't have any hands. He's only got our hands. He's only got our mouth. That's and right. When I when I hear your testimony, I mean, you know, I know you were a lawyer in Los Angeles pursuing yeah. cheap thrills, if I might add. No, no, and I was a lawyer. Sudden, the hand of God came and said. I'm going to use this man's hands. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah. And I, I just, I just want to say it is, it is. Uh, I mean, this transmission of nonviolent social change, this transmission of the universal message right. of breaking down the walls, that is God's message for us today. Yeah. There is no. There is no. Listen to me. There is no practical. Listen to me, care. There is no practical political alternative aside from. Ideological, there's no practical political alternative because all, all political alternatives lead to dead ends. Okay, you want to bring about constructive change, you got to do it with not, a commitment to nonviolence and love and a commitment to the pursuit of excellence. And I learned as a young hotshot lawyer, I thought I had pretty good vision. Okay, but I learned it all white people. They may look alike from a distance, but they're not alike when you get up close. <laughs> That's what I learned. So one of the people here is Audrey Kitagawa. Another lawyer, and another lawyer, Bill. She's a lawyer and she's an interfaith person and spiritual giant. She's got some questions that, that she would like to ask. Any questions? Thank you so much, Mr. Jones. I was so touched and moved by what you shared. And especially, you know, you mentioned uh, your mother, and I know she passed away at a very young age of 52 yeah. years old. Yeah. And, you know, it seems that the role of your mother in your life was extremely important, even though you spent a lot of your years away from her. Mm. And, uh, you know, in Dr. Uh, King quoting Lanston Hughes poem, Mother to Son, when he gave his sermon at Friendship Baptist Church in Los Angeles that had you in tears and touched you so deeply that you knew you had to be with Dr. King. Previous to that time, you were kind of resisting his entreaties for you to join him. Mm -hmm. And please share with us what about Dr. King's recitation of that poem, Mother to Son, that spoke to you so deeply about your relationship with your mother that really changed the trajectory of your life and made you decide to join Dr. King? Well, until I went to that Baptist church, I never heard, I never, uh, heard or seen Dr. King speak before. And the text of uh, his sermon was a role and responsibility 
of the Negro professional to aid our less fortunate brothers and sisters who are struggling with freedom in the South. So when I heard him tell him how he's going to say that, people saying amen, I said, this is one smart dude, man. He went to, you know, the, the, he went to the, the church of the great intellectual. Anyway, Dr. King, I never heard Dr. King speak before. Uh, when I heard him, I was, I mean, I watched him. I said, no, 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 it can't be. <laughs> it cannot be that what I'm hearing coming out of this voice, that it cannot be. I never heard, I never heard any human being speak like that before. And then there came a point in this service where he made a reference to my mother. Because when he visited me at my house, I told him my mother had been a domestic household servant. I know this. But he, he, he took a poem by Langston Hughes called A Letter from Mother to Son. And what the actual poem is that Langston wrote, uh, the actual poem talks about a Negro woman scrubbing a staircase. And she pauses periodically on the staircase. And she says, I'm, uh, and so many words that, uh, uh, son, I'm doing this for you. Don't you give up. Life ain't been no crystal stair. Well, when he quoted that poem and he made my mother, whom he never saw, but whom he heard me describe to him, when, when he made my mother the actor in the revised <laughs> Langston Hughes poem that he had revised in order to make my mother the actor, I'm in the church and I start to cry. I mean, I, I just couldn't hold back. It was like it's a video thing. I'm, I'm in a video picture of my mother. So the church service is over. And he's on the steps of the pulpit giving autographs. And as I walk over and I get new, near him, he says, you know, I never mentioned your name, Mr. Jones. You know, I never mentioned your name. I didn't say anything. I just walked up to him. And when I got to him, I grabbed his uh, right shoulder and pulled his left, pulled his right hand to me and shook his left hand and pulled him close to me. And I said, Dr. King, when do you want me to go to Birmingham, Alabama? Oh. And in my book, I called out. Oh. The Making of a Disciple. In my book, I call that. That transformed me. My, never, my, my, my mother never saw me graduate from. My mother, I, was, I graduated, I went to public high school, voted most likely to succeed, President of the Honor Society, class speaker, valedictorian. My mother saw me do that but she never saw any other part of my life. She knew that I got into Columbia College on a scholarship. She never saw me graduate from Columbia. She never saw me go to law school. She never saw the grandchildren that she would have had had she lived. She never saw any of that. So I lived my unfulfilled family life through my years of love and devotion as an only child for a brother I never had for working with Martin Luther King Jr. I told Martin, I'm an only child. He had brothers, he had a big family. I didn't have anybody in my family. I said, Martin, you, you like the brother I never had. I said, if I had a brother, I don't think he ended up that Baptist preacher, but that's the best, that's what you are, that's what you are. Mm. But I loved the brother. And he knew I, let's see. See, I, I, I know, uh, human beings have certain things that uh, 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 they share with animals. I mean, we want to be separated from animals, I understand. 
But you know, if you have a dog, for example, the dog can't talk. Well, the dog will be, the dog, if you raise the dog, the dog, I mean, I, I had a German Shepherd. When, my, when I got married, I had a German Shepherd. I had, to give the, I, had to, I had to get rid of the German Shepherd. It broke my heart because the German Shepherd was so protective of, of me and my kids. He misunderstood when we have kids come and play with my kids. A tussle with me, he would want to, he would, <laughs> he would want to attack the people who were playing with me. So I had to give the dog away and I loved the dog immensely because I was afraid of being sued because he bites somebody. But what I'm paying to say is that animals respond Animals respond to love. Human beings respond to love. I know what's going on in the violence that's taking place among blacks on blacks killing. I know what's going on. It's the unfettered access to guns and the absence of any one of those perpetrators feeling like there's somebody like a Clarence Jones who say, I love you, I love you unconditionally. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what you've done. There's nothing you can do that's gonna stop my love for you. So put that gun down and come on, get with the program. So that's how, but no, I, I mean, I believe in the power of love. I, I mean, I've had the benefit of great medical things and a lot of friendships. You know why I'm 91 today with all the things? Because I love myself. And because I feel I have a commitment and a job to do. Ain't no way that Martin King would say, now hold on, Clarence, you know. I mean, you, you saw they killed me in 1968. And what you gonna do? But what are you going to do? I mean, I know you like martinis, but you're going to get you drunk. Are you going to start taking drugs? Or are you going to carry on? Are you going to carry on the very thing that you knew I cared about and was murdered for? If I can't count on you, Clarence, then I can't count on anybody. So... I'm 91 and I will not disappoint Martin Luther King Jr. It will not occur on my watch. No, 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 no. You want me to turn against my Jewish brothers and sisters merely because their grandparents are something and they still have an affinity for Israel? And Israel's got some cousin, but you want me to turn against them? Is that what you want me to do? Not in my lifetime. Not in my lifetime while I have a breath I can breathe. Clarence, we are with you. And the, and, and the fire in your heart is lit in many people who heard this testimony. I want to make sure that we do some more of this if, if, you're, if you've got some more juice. This has got to get in front of the American Bar Association. Lawyers got to step up like well, you You know did. what the American Bar Association did for me, don't, don't you, Jana? Jana? Yeah. I mean, I was astounded. I mean, I, they, they gave me the uh, Thurgood Marshall Award, okay, which I was pleased to have. But little did I know that who was going to speak and present the award in tribute to me was President Obama. I couldn't believe it. I mean, you could have knocked me off with a feather. I said, what? <laughs> when they told me that President Obama was speaking in behalf of I, I said, what? This is, this is, I couldn't believe it. Well, we need some more. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, Marilyn put this together with the Charter of Compassion and yep. this is an initiative that's carrying the message. We got to hand it over to her to let us bring us home. Okay. And, and we got to, I mean, I just, I know I'm speaking on behalf of thousands of people that heard this. Well, let me, let me say to you. Thank you. And to Marilyn, well, let me say to everybody here, you know, I'm, I'm busy. But I'm not too busy for love. Mm. 
You hear what I'm talking about? I, I think I hear you and- um... You know what love is when you get to be 91? I ain't, I, I'm not too busy for love. I love you guys. I love your soul. You want, to, you want me to live for another five or six years? Yes. Seven years? You want to keep me alive? Yes, we do. Yes. And yeah, you keep me alive by inviting me. You keep me alive by asking me to, to be with you. That's going to keep me alive. Oh, absolutely, Clarence. You got a witness here with all of us. Well, okay? we're, we're ready. We're ready to do okay? that. Don't, be let no, don't let no old guy die here in Palo Alto without hearing from you now. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna follow this up and we are going to make another invitation. And, you know, Clarence- um, By the way, you, excuse me, that, that, Marilyn, I just saw a beautiful picture to your right shoulder. What is that picture? Uh, let me see. What it's is that, a picture that? of, it's called Los Muertos, huh? uh, the Day of the Dead. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, it was, uh, I did a book on the Day of the Dead for the Mexican Art Museum a number oh, okay. of years ago. And that was, that's part of the cover. Okay. But I, I wanted to say that, you know, you help us realize that each of us is a sum total of everyone that we've encountered and Hello. all of the experiences that we've Hello. had. And, you know, you're, you're not an accident of, of history. Um, you, you're like a purveyor of history for us. Uh, you you speak just not only um, to the heart, but you you speak to the soul. And right. I was in India a number of years ago, and and this is a little bit like your story that you had with uh, Lek Balensa, who I think really helped us to begin to understand what solidarity with yes, Solidarash yes, was all yes, about. Yes. Yeah. But, in India, I was at a school assembly and the students uh, started to sing Hum Honge Kamayad. And I joined in. And at the end, you know, after everyone was applauding, and the principal said, Does anyone have any questions of our visitors? And so uh, one of the students said, Can you tell me why you know our song? And I said, it would, the song was, We Shall Overcome. Mm. And so we had an incredible exchange <laughs> about, about that song and the history of Martin Luther King and Gandhi right. and the push that we have in our hearts, I hope, for, for peace. And so I, I just want to thank you so much, but I also want to invite people to continue uh, to journey with us on this 40 days. Uh, tomorrow, we have Peace Literacy with Paul Chappelle, who's a West Pointer, uh, who has decided to devote his life to bringing people together on the March for Peace. And- Paul oh, Chappelle um, running for public office? You know, we might ask him tomorrow. No, I thought maybe, maybe I confused myself. I'm, I'm glad, that's good, that's good. Yeah. And then, and then on uh, Thursday, we have Thomas Sobel uh, from Germany, Austria, coming to us talking about turning towards the individual ancestral and collective trauma, um, trying to heal the wounds of the past. And, and uh, Thomas has an incredible book called Healing Collective Trauma. And we're really looking forward to that. Thank you, everyone, for your patience this morning as we were trying to get things settled with Zoom. Um, and boy, wasn't it worth the wait. And I hope that we'll, we'll enter into part two very soon. Good. Thank you again. Thank Bye, you. everyone. My love to all of you. Thank you. for Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. So thank much. you. Thank you. Thank you for this gift which you gave me today.